Like all generations, but arguably more than most, our students are living through a time of profound change, politically, economically, environmentally, and socially. Um, what I have found is that utopias and dystopias feel particularly profoundly relevant in the context of my students' experiences in the world and the ways in which they make sense of those experiences. And this is such an advantage in the literature classroom. And I'm speaking as someone who's typically um, teaching Shakespeare and other early modern stuff, the, the relevance of which is not often evident to, to my students. And so I'm trying to make a lot of arguments about why it might matter to them in their lives. But when you teach utopia and dystopia, the stakes are really clear. Um, to everyone in the classroom. And this means the level of investment is, is, is often there right from the beginning. And that's the advantage of teaching literature like this. Another thing a course in utopia and dystopia can do is remind us over and over again how fiction can become a powerful way of engaging with and reckoning with the world, with things that are happening in the world and possibly also provide a way of imagining and creating new worlds. Utopias are really great to think with. I often describe them as a kind of thought experiment that extends into classroom discussion, collaboration, and individual writing projects in all kinds of marvelous ways. <clears throat> so one thing that utopias do is, is prompt readers to um, adopt different perspectives and think critically about the, their own home worlds, right? So often the experience of traveling to a utopia and reading it um, provokes in the reader's mind and your student's mind a critical perspective on their own daily life and the things that they think of as natural or take for granted in their daily life. Um, and this is, this is what I call the kind of practical orientation of my utopia class when I teach it at the university level. And when I do teach it, I always um, build the class towards a final project in which the students are asked to create their own utopian fiction, one that follows the rules of the genre as, as they've been learning about it <clears throat> in the class. And it's this ability to integrate their reading with their writing, the content of what they're studying with their own critical analysis of these texts. Um, this kind of comp ability to do um, studying and thinking um, works really well with how I'm understanding the TEKS standards as I've been reading them. And th this is, I think, a, a huge advantage to you all in the classroom. So a utopia unit can, can really en emphasize um, what the standards call the interconnected nature of listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking. Um, so it's a kind of heavily integrated unit. It helps them uh, think about the author's craft and purpose, as well as the composition of the text themselves and how that impacts or could feed into composition in their own writing. And this is kind of, you know, oftentimes, most of the time, um, my students are not excited to be writing. <laughs> and this is one of the cl these classes where when I offer these creative assignments, they're really excited to, to get to writing. And so that's not another huge advantage in, in teaching this material. Uh, you learn so much about your students, actually, about their hopes and their fears, as well as how they perceive the, the rules that are structuring um, their own daily life. So with that, as, as my opening pitch, I'm going to share my PowerPoint and just Oh, excuse me, say a little bit more about utopia. Okay, so the word itself, utopia, was coined or invented by Sir Thomas More in a book of that name published in Latin in 1516. And this is a woodcut of some early editions of the utopia. More was a famous English humanist. He was Lord Chancellor to King Henry VIII. And his utopia is a philosophical text that presents itself as a traveler's tale. It pretends to be a traveler's tale. So its narrator, a man named Raphael Hithliday, is a fictional traveler who's recently journeyed to an idealized island nation, one that has an apparently perfect political system. And the text is in part a description of what he's seen there. The name of the island 
is utopia. And this is again a word of Moore's invention that means either no place, utopos, and possibly also good place, utopos. And this tension between these two possible meanings of this word, of this word, the not place and the good place, is fundamental to the genre throughout its, its long history. This question of whether or not utopia could can ever be brought into existence and whether or not it's ever really very good. These are tensions are sort of fundamental to the genre. An early reader of Moore's Utopia called it a way of patterning a commonwealth. And now scholars often give the name utopia to any work that describes an ideal commonwealth or, or society whose inhabitants exist under seemingly perfect conditions. This kind of story is far older than Thomas More's Utopia. So for example, Plato's Republic could be called a utopian fiction because it features a dialogue in which the philosopher Socrates imagines a perfectly just state. But it's Thomas More's text that gave the genre its name and also gave it the narrative form of the traveler's tale. Okay, but thinking about this pun on the not place and the good place, what if the utopia doesn't seem to its readers to be a particularly good place? Can it still be called a utopia? Um, for many 20th century readers, the answer is definitely no, leading to the widespread use of the term dystopia to describe certain literary productions such as Brave New World and also 1984, which are two of the fr most frequently taught 20th century utopias. The word dystopia um, was coined by an Englishman named John Stuart Mill in 1868 in a parliamentary debate describing a bad place, but the word didn't enter common currency until the 20th century. Some critics now say that dystopia uh, becomes the prevalent utopian form in the 20th century after the horrors of World War I, bleaker forms of utopia came to predominate. The 20th century is in many ways a nightmare century. After the mass killings of two catastrophic world wars, there was no longer widespread faith in technological progress or the progress of reason and science. And after the rise of the Soviet Union, there was also a sense, uh, particularly among European and American intellectuals, that social- I think they did the silent evacuation already, if you wanted to go. Sometimes they forget to come over here. Oh. Sorry, I'll keep going. I think, anyway, <laughs> there is no, among American intellectuals that social collectivism had massively failed. Um, in responding to this new mood, the utopias of the 20th century has, have all, often been correspondingly bleak with the brief exception of a series of works published by left-leaning political radicals and feminists in the 1970s. This is in the decade following the rise of the radical student movement. Um, during which time there was a new surge of optimism about social reform. Nevertheless, many 20th century utopias feature a quasi omnipotent, monolithic, totalitarian state, one that demands complete obedience. This state often relies on scientific and technological advances to ensure social control. And over the course of the fiction, this state may be challenged by some vestigial individualism, but never successfully. However, although the use of this term dystopia has become commonplace, not everyone agrees about whether and how it should be assigned to particular literary texts. For example, some scholars argue that utopia is always inherently dystopia because the desire to create an improved society always implies some punitive methods of social control, which inevitably results in a, in a police state. Um, in addition, whether or not a given reader thinks of utopia as either good or bad depends on their perspective, right? So, so it, where you are in, in the world will often shape your impression of whether the world depicted in the utopia is a good one or a bad one. Moreover, many early utopias seem satirical in intention. 
What I often say to my students is that our task as literary scholars is not only to make evaluative decisions, that is to say, this society depicted in this story is good or bad, or this plan to reorganize social and economic life is practical or impractical. So I say, don't just try to make evaluative decisions, but try to think about how these texts work as literary inventions. And in order to do this, I talk a lot about the idiom of utopia, that is its literary qualities and distinctive set of traits. And I thought I'd share some of the key ones with you now. <clears throat> um, first, a utopia describes an imaginary society in some detail, focusing in particular on the rituals that constitute social life. That society is always isolated, initially on an island or in some other remote location, including eventually other planets. Over the past 500 or so years since Thomas More invented the genre, the journey to utopia has increasingly tended to be a journey in time as well as a journey in space, right? So the, the distance between home and the utopian world isn't just geographic, but also potentially temporal, right? What's key is that the place of the utopia is separate in some way, and it could be far, far away, or perhaps in a, in a distant time. As in the term utopia, which is a, a grammatical negation, a no place, these worlds are always created through negation. So some feature of the author's world is negated or eliminated. And then the text explores the, the consequences of that removal. So in Thomas More's Utopia, private property has been eliminated. And then, and then in a sense, the text explores everything that would be different if there were no private property. And it's often really fun when you're teaching these kinds of stories to ask your students, what's the most important thing that's been removed? Um, and what are the consequences of that removal? These fictions often begin when a first person narrator is given a tour of the alien society and the story is made up of a, a philosophical dialogue between the guide and the narrator. Utopias often stress the legal or technological structure of the alien societies and the focus tends to be on the society as a whole rather than on individual varieties of existence within that society although that certainly changes in, in the 20th and 21st century adaptations of the genre, which are often very invested in individual characters. Uh, the description or tour of the utopian society is often contained within a frame story. And the outer frame is usually an imaginary voyage that has stranded the traveler on the island or the remote location. And the apparatus of the text reinforces this fictional frame. So like the fun of these texts is they're all pretending to be true, <laughs> true stories. So for example, Thomas More includes all kinds of extra materials in the early published text, including this alphabet for the utopian language, as well as a variety of maps. And, and so I always ask my students, do you read, you know, do, have you ever read fictional stories or fantasy novels that come with maps? Like what's the point of the map? What's the map doing there? This is a kind of utopian device that's common to the genre. Um, uto so utopian fictions to start to sum up some of what I've been saying are usually narrated by a traveler. The traveler has discovered a new world or a new community by accident. The traveler then learns about this new world through a series of dialogues with their hosts and through these dialogues is instructed in the habits and rituals of the society. In this way, you could say that the narrative of the utopia operates dramatically in that the review of the utopian society sharply contrasts to the normal expectations of the narrator and the reader. So for example, in, in Moore's Utopia, the, the, one of the most memorable facts of this um, island is that they, they hold um, gold and disdain. And the way they, that they demonstrate their disdain for gold and other mineral wealth is that all of their toilets are made of gold. <laughs> 
right? And so, so, so this is this this moment of um, total estrangement and alienation when the reader, who who typically would value gold and wealth, is is encountering a place where where gold is is so degraded that they use it for their toilets. So it's that kind of moment that comes through in Utopias. And this is how they start to estrange their readers from um, commonplace assumptions in daily life. In this way, um, and this is the kind of uh, typical or paradigmatic argument scholars often make about utopian fiction and its, its sort of descendant science fiction and how it works. They say it's a kind of genre of estrangement. It, it operates as a form of estrangement. Right, and so the, the fiction of the journey elsewhere allows the reader to um, view their home world from the perspective of an alien, right? To start to think about all of the things in their daily life that they assume are normal, but, but might be regarded as strange. Um, when Moore uh, first wrote Utopia, the European exploration and colonization of the so-called New World of the Americas was just beginning. And, and so the genre is heavily influ influenced by this exploration, but with one crucial difference, and that is the traveler to the Utopia doesn't find a so-called primitive people, but rather discovers a complex and highly evolved society a culture that's more sophisticated than the place from which the traveler has departed, more politically and technologically advanced. And it's always the explorer who's the so-called primitive when they arrive on the island of Utopia. Again, in this way, utopian fiction can, can problematize the culture out of which it emerges, throwing traditional forms of power off balance. Um, and the deconstruction of the so-called hierarchy between the civilized and the savage or the civilized and the barbarous is a key feature of the genre. It's one of the major themes of the genre. In the 20th and 21st centuries, utopias and their descendants within the science fiction genre have focused more and more on science rather than on revolutionary social programs, imagining worlds of technological domination in which technology has transmogrified the body. These utopias feature prostheses, clones, implants, replicants, and the erasure of the boundaries between the organic and the mechanical. Um, so if for this, the, the kind of older wave of utopia, the key binary is freedom versus stability in the organization of, of society. In the 20th and 21st century, the key binary re really seems to be um, human machine or organic mechanical. Um, okay, so what are some questions or problems that come out of the study of this genre? Uh, number one, and this is the big one, why use fiction to outline a social program? If you read these texts, you feel like they want you to do something. <laughs> you know, you can't, if you read Thomas More's Utopia and this elaborate depiction of a world with, in which everything is held in common and there's no private property, you feel as if you're supposed to go do something after you read it. But the question is what? And if Thomas More really wants me to go do something, to go change something, why wouldn't he just tell me? <laughs> You know, why create an elaborate fiction in order to outline a social program? And this is a really important um, thing to discuss with students. <clears throat> Does the use of fiction have the effect of trivializing or demeaning any political program that animates the utopian text? Or perhaps, is it because the only way to conceptualize a better society is by using the imagination? <clears throat> by inventing something in a fictional space. That's, that's the only path forward. And so that's a really interesting conversation to have. Um, another, another problem that comes from the study of Utopia is where does the author of a Utopia stand? That is, how seriously should we take these stories? Um, are they in serious proposals for social reform? Or are they simply a game? Um, can we even imagine a better world? And our, lastly, are utopias ever really good? 
I mean, it's actually hard to, you, you know, if you, you, when you read these texts, you think you would never want to live in any of them. <laughs> so, so is, is it ever possible to have a truly good or ideal utopia is a major problem of the genre. Okay, <clears throat> and then I wanted to, to also give some key binaries or themes that come through in utopian fiction and that come into play in so many of these texts. And these include the difference or lack of difference between the real and the not real, you know, thinking about the framing device where these texts pretend like they're true stories, even though they're not, uh, the relationship between the so-called civilized and the savage, the, the boundary or difference between the human and animal, as well as the human and the machine, or the biological and the mechanical, um, the tension uh, between the desire for freedom and a need for stability, um, and then the potential for evolution and also dev devolution. Um, these are just some of the utopias I often teach in my survey. Um, I love to teach these classes um, through a series of creative assignments. And that's what I, I've shared with you all um, when we get to the breakout rooms. Um, and, and the reason that the creative assignments work really well is that they prompt the students to take this idiom, to take these formal features that they're learning about in their reading and use those formal features to, to wrestle with these thematic problems. Right, and so to think about how do you how do you mark the difference between a human and an animal, or between a human and a machine, um, but to work through that philosophical or political problem by telling a story that takes a particular form. Um, and I have just a, I think four or five short minutes remaining, and I thought I'd take you through really quickly some of the texts that I assign. Um, just so you have a sense of like what's available to you in a unit on the genre. Um, Gulliver's Travels, I teach the fourth book of Gulliver's Travels, where this fictional invented author character, Lemuel Gull Gulliver, travels to an island uh, filled with highly rational creatures that look to him like horses and learns that they are superior in all ways. Um, to the, the world of human beings from which he's, he's left. And, and we have really great arguments when I teach this uh, text about whether or not um, John, Jonathan Swift is, is trying to get us to think about animals and the way we treat them or whether it's simply a metaphor for thinking about human irrationality. Um, another text I would love to recommend to you is Samuel Butler's Erewhon or Over the Range. Um, Erewhon is an anagram for nowhere, which is a kind of pun on utopia. This is a 19th century text. Butler was an English colonist in New Zealand. And while he was in New Zealand in the 1860s, he became expert in what was then the, the vanguard new theory of, of, of evolution uh, developed by Charles Darwin. And, and in Erewhon, he wrote about an isolated world in which the the members of this community became convinced based on Darwin's theory of evolution that machines would evolve through natural selection in order to ultimately um, revolt and take over from their human masters. And because they feared this ultimate rise of the machines, they destroy all machines. Um, and so this is a quite a long text, but there are three books and there are chapters in the middle called the Book of the Machines, and they teach wonderfully well. And you can have sort of have this argument with your students or stage a series of debates about whether or not machines might achieve consciousness. I also teach the Island of Dr. Moreau, which is a late 19th century text about a, a kind of mad vivisector isolated on an island who's trying to um, turn animals into human-like creatures. And uh, you can talk to students about the, re the relationship between humans and animals, but also the extent to which science and scientific discoveries are or aren't a, a human good or a public good. This text, which I recently started teaching is called Imperium and Imperio is written by a man named Sutton Griggs, a Baptist preacher who sold this text door to door at the end of the 19th century. The title means empire within an empire or perhaps nation within a nation. 
and it is the fiction that there is a black separatist utopia that's been founded in secret just outside of Waco, Texas, in order to more fully embody the ideals contained within the Declaration of Independence. Um, and this was the inspiration for the writing assignment I provided to you in which the students are asked to create a, a educational manifesto for a separatist society hidden within a larger world. Um, very um, familiar text, Brave New World, um, inspired by a line from Shakespeare's Tempest, uh, describes a world 600 years after Ford, specifically after the invention of the Model T, in which there's a kind of future Britain in which institutionalized eugenic engineering is securing a, a rigidly hierarchical class-based society, right? And so it's as if the entire world were structured around industrial mass production. Um, and this is a text in which the contrast between freedom and stability is made quite clear to the students. And it, it gives, a, it gives um, the class a really focused way to think about um, uh, priorities around social good. Um, a short story by Philip K. Dick called Minority Report is so much fun to teach. Um, this is, uh, imagines a world in which crime has been virtually abolished through the employment of mentally disabled people who are able to see crimes before they have been committed. And then this allows the government to arrest people who would commit a crime but haven't yet committed a crime. And so it raises all kinds of questions about uh, guilt, innocence, and whether or not there is free will. And students love this story. Um, the Handmaid's Tale, uh, this is a, a kind of thriller, dystopian psychological story about um, that imagines that a right-wing theocratic coup has overthrown the United States government at the end of the 20th century. Um, and the major national issue is the widespread sterility of the population, which seems to be the result of nuclear or chemical pollution. And the, the, the new government of Gilead addresses this problem through sexual surrogacy. And this novel is narrated by one of the first women handmaids who's been given over to the new regime. Um, and it's a really surprisingly beautifully written novel. Women have been denied the opportunity to read and write. And so you have this story uh, recorded by a woman who can no longer read, but is still fascinated with, with um, language. Um, the last thing I wanna recommend to you is this text, Dance Dance Revolution from 2007. It's uh, written by an American poet named Kathy Park Hong. Um, and the text is a collection of poems embedded within a futuristic science fiction plot. And the poems are written in this uh, global language called Desert Creole. And, and for, you know, for anyone teaching students who um, are coming from dual language backgrounds, this is a really wonderful opportunity to think about um, language blending that happens in, in the ways in which language is or isn't tied to a sense of home or place. Um, I'm just almost out of time. I'll say one last thing, and this is a short story by Ursula Le Guin called The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas, um, which poses what she calls the dilemma of an American conscience. And, and it asks the reader very directly about what they might be willing to give up in order to live in a perfect world. So these are all, I'll stop sharing now and come back to you. Um, these are all texts that are kind of tested for me in the classroom. There are many, many others you might offer, but they have worked really well for me in this, in a sequence, um, giving, I, I recognize you probably can't devote all of this time and couldn't assign all of these texts as once, but they provide a way for students to start to build a knowledge of the genre as it kind of evolves in, in literary history and start to take what they've learned into their own writing. Um, and again, this is just what I love about teaching this class is they learn, they can learn through doing. Um, 
And, and at the same time, think really hard and really seriously about issues and problems that, that matter to them. Um, and that's another part of the gift of teaching this material. Um, but I think I've taken up my allotted introduction time. So I think I better pause now for questions.